Welcome to our YouTube channel. My name is Tony and my partner in crime is Charlie. We'll be producing medical videos that hopefully you'll find interesting and useful. If you have any questions or concerns or comments, please leave a message below and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Also, if you find our YouTube videos useful, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. In today's lecture series, we will talk about immunosuppressant drugs, specifically focusing on corticosteroids. Now before we get into it, let's try to answer this basic question on the screen right now. When do we need immunosuppression? Well, there are two instances where immunosuppression is absolutely vital. Firstly, an organ transplantation in order to prevent rejection of the new organ. And secondly, if there is inappropriate or overactivation of our own immune system. This can occur in autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, where there's an inappropriate activation of our own immune system against self antigens. And this can also occur in chronic inflammatory diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease in which there's an overactivation of our own immune system. Now, when we talk about corticosteroids, we can split them up into two groups, glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. They both have separate functions in the body, but an important, an important action that glucocorticoids have is the immunosuppression action. Therefore, we will focus on them. The body naturally produces cortisol in the adrenal gland, and it is our endogenous glucocorticoid. Many drug companies produce derivatives of cortisol, which have better pharmacokinetics and may have stronger glucocorticoid action, less mineralocorticoid action, or other special functions. Therefore, when I talk in this lecture about using cortisol, you can replace that word with betamethasone, prednisolone, and other cortisol derivatives. Now, if we look at cortisol in more detail, we can see that it resembles cholesterol, and that is because of these four carbon rings right here. And that is because cortisol is actually derived from cholesterol. And so, because it is derived from cholesterol, it is lipophilic, and therefore it can cross plasma membranes easily. However, in order to travel in the blood, it must be bound onto a protein. Let's look into the mechanism of action in a little bit more detail. As I said previously, cortisol is bound onto corticosteroid binding globulin in the blood. About 75% of it is bound to this protein here. The remaining 25% is bound to albumin. And only about 1% of cortisol is free. But it's the free cortisol that's the active cortisol, and that's important to remember. So that 1% of cortisol that is not bound onto a protein is the cortisol that will, in due effect, lead to a response right here. That free cortisol, because of its lipophilic property, can cross the plasma membrane and bind onto a glucocorticoid receptor. Once bound onto the receptor, these heat shock proteins will disassociate and allow the receptor to dimerize and become activated. Once activated, this receptor will translocate into the nucleus and bind onto glucocorticoid response element. Once bound onto this, we will get transcription, translation, and protein production of specific genes. That's important. We don't just bind onto glucocorticoid res response element and trans transcribe a bunch of genes, a bunch of random genes. A specific complement of genes will be transcribed and therefore a specific complement of protein will be made and a specific response will take place. And the specific response that we are interested in are anti-inflammatory actions and also immunosuppressant actions. If we look at the effects of glucocorticoids in inflammation, there are five major things that occur. 
we get a decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1, 8, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. We also get a decrease in nitrogen oxide synthase. This decrease in this enzyme will lead to a decrease in nitrogen oxide which acts as a vasodilator and increases the leakiness of capillaries. By getting rid of this effect of vasodilation and leakiness, we will decrease the amount of inflammation in the area. Third, we will get a decrease in phospholipase A2, which leads to production of arachidonic acid, and COX-2, which is an inducible enzyme, which is induced by pro-inflammatory cytokines such as these here mentioned above. By decreasing these two enzymes here, we will get a decrease in the synthesis of prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which are pro-inflammatory. Next, we will get a decrease in adhesion molecules. See, when white blood cells actually travel in the blood, in order for them to get out, they must roll onto the endothelium and adhere to it. Once, adhere, once it has adhered to the endothelium, it can translocate into the interstitial fluid through a process called diapodesis. Because we're going to reduce the amount of adhesion molecules expressed on the endothelial cells, we will also reduce immigration of the leukocytes from the vessels and therefore decrease the immune response. Lastly, glucocorticoids will increase the expression of endonucleases and this in turn will lead to apoptosis of lymphocytes and eosinophils. Clinical uses of corticosteroids are vast. Now I'm going to tell you a couple of important concepts that you must take with you. Firstly, corticosteroids can be administered in many different ways. There can be systemic administration, which can be oral or IV, or topical administration, which can be inhaled, creams, drops, enemas, or many other methods. Now, administering it systemically or topically has a big consequence. Most of the side effects of corticosteroids is due to systemic administration. And if you use corticosteroids chronically, the adverse effects outweigh the benefits. Therefore, a clinician must take into account what the adverse drug reactions will be and the potential benefits before deciding to choose this drug. Topical administration of this drug is quite safe and the adverse drug reactions are quite minimal. As you can see on the right side here, there are many clinical uses of corticosteroids, ranging from asthma, eczema, inflammatory bowel disease, to transplant rejection. Now let's talk about the adverse effects of corticosteroids. But just before we get here, I have a question to ask you to see if you know the answer to it. How long do you think when you administer this drug to a patient, it will take for the effect to be seen? Now think carefully. Corticosteroids are lipophilic and they must be bound to the receptor which translocates into the nucleus and activates certain genes. Now, is transcribing and translating genes a slow process or a quick process? It's a slow process and therefore the action of corticosteroids will take hours, not minutes. That's an important thing to remember. Now let's get on with the adverse effects. Well, we have acute or dose-related side effects, and I'm going to point out some of the important ones here. Hypertension is a really important one. See, glucocorticoids bind onto glucocorticoid receptors. However, they can also bind onto mineralocorticoid receptors. At normal levels, they usually tend not to bind onto mineralocorticoid receptors. However, if you administer acutely a large dose, then you can get binding of cortisol or its derivatives to the mineralocorticoid receptors. And these receptors will lead to water and salt retention, 
increasing plasma volume and therefore increasing hypertension. In any drug, in the future lectures we'll talk about many other drugs, but any drug that reduces the immune system's response will lead to opportunistic infections. An opportunistic infection is an infection that is abnormally severe or a normal person wouldn't get it. Some other side effects are acne, psychosis, type 2 diabetes, and weight gain. We also have chronic or dose slash duration related side effects. If you do a little bit of reading on Cushing's disease, you'll notice that these symptoms here look awfully a lot like the symptoms seen in a person who has Cushing's. And that is because in Cushing's disease, you have an overproduction of cortisol leading to all these effects. And in chronic administration of this drug, it's almost as though you have increased levels of cortisol in the system. And therefore, the effects that take place resemble those seen in a Cushing's patient. You get side effects such as cataracts, striae, osteoporosis, osteonecrosis, and skin thinning. Thank you very much.